Shall we start? Okay, warm good morning. Uh, this instruction course is uh, for uh, uh, facing, how to face practical exams. And uh, myself, Dr. Padma and my team will uh, give you an examiner's perspective. So, um, the first talk, can you please load the first talk? Okay. A case, if it is properly taken, will give you confidence and it will create an impression on the examiner. So, format, you all know. How many of you are PGs? Fine. So, format, you know. What are the points which we should consider? Next slide. First, it should be relevant and appropriate to the case. Say, for example, you have a UVA case. You should definitely say positive findings and negative findings in slit lamp. Gonioscopy must. Do not forget IOP fluctuation. Pupil very important in all cases. Okay. Corneal sensation don't forget. And finally fundus comment on the disc, macula, choroid and pars plana. Let us do one more example. We have an orbital case, neuroftalma case, even uh, certain squin cases. You have to get proptometry, ptosis measurement, extraocular movements including saccade so that we pick up some thought of nystagmus like Brunt's nystagmus. Here also corneal sensation many often students forget. IOP fluctuation, hypotony, gonio not possible in hypotony. And if there is proptosis post action test and in fundus look at the disc for disc edema, pallor, optico shunt and vascular changes. Vascular changes in the retina, the macula, coronal folds and some lesions in the fundus. So negative is important in every case relevant to that particular case. Next, it should be systematic and complete. So where do you start? You will start now. Exams are coming in January. So speak with your seniors and your mentors. Get a list of uh, cases which are usually kept and then identify the salient points. Mesh it according to the age and uh, gender. For example, bilateral primary optic atrophy, if it is a child, think about post-infectious, post-vaccinal demyelination. In a middle-aged, multiple sclerosis, pituitary, vasculitis, and in elderly, ischemia is the first differential diagnosis. So this has to be prepared well in advance. Time management, everybody from KUHS? So know your university, know your time. So prepare well in advance start writing the case sheet whichever be the case uh, whether it is you mesh it you have already meshed it as long case short case so start writing it and at the end always keep 10 percent time back for summarizing and planning the management strategy diagrams and colors will help you to avoid long description make it short draw it and finish it off cornea end on section cross section gonio fundus, diplopia, wherever you can draw, you draw and finish it off. Summary should be clear and relevant. Most important point, do not repeat. So let me uh, tell you one uh, summary. A 47 year old female uh, came with pain, redness, defective vision of three days duration, history of similar complaint one year back, took three to four months to subside, needed systemic treatment, history of PT in the family, no relevant history pertaining to this particular case, on examination has asymmetric bilateral granulomatous panuviatus with acute exacerbation in the right eye, with hypotony, complicated cataract and cystoid macular edema, vision of such and such, pupil normal, diagnosis. This is the summary that we want. Okay, next. So finally, when you have a diagnosis, there are three components. All cases may not have these three components, like primary open angle glaucoma, finished. If it is secondary open angle glaucoma, you have etiology, you have DD, right? So in uveitis, structural diagnosis, we have already said, etiological TB, sarcoid, syphilis, VKH, all those things. And finally, if it was unilateral, we could have put a DD, chronic uveitis due to RD, like that. Okay, so with this, you should have a plan. At the end, you should have a plan for management in your mind, which includes investigation as well as treatment. Investigation, uh, how will you say? CBC, SR, RBS? No, it's not for postgraduates. You have to say leukocytosis, thrombocytopenia, uh, then uh, diabetic control, nephropathy, FFA4, capillary non perfusion areas, uh, T sign in ultrasound, like that. Be specific and pin, uh, tell why this particular in investigation you want. Management, what is the plan? You have medical management, 
acute management adjunctive therapy in, uh, intervention and finally the definitive surgical therapy so this plan you should prepare well in advance for every case you may get during the uh, during the exam once you start it you will understand that there are groups in which same plan same management works so that is where it becomes easy for you so you can expect adrenaline surge in your exam so prepare well in advance before you sit in the hot seat so with this overview we'll take you through all different aspects of examination uh, over to anu madam will be dealing with anterior segment examination so good morning all so first we'll be uh, discussing uh, different anterior segment cases so how will you approach to a case so as you know any case we start with a detailed history then we'll go to a examination so what are the different symptoms of the patient so you, you will get sudden uh, painful loss of vision or a gradual painless loss of vision so sudden loss of vision the disease can be it can be due to trauma corneal ulcer herpes zoster or interstitial keratitis gradual painless loss of vision can be due to corneal opacities De degenerations and dystrophies we may also get uh, symptoms like colored halos and frequent change of glasses in cases with keratoconus you will also get photophobia redness watering and these are different um, symptoms you usually patient present with in corneal cases so first we see a case this is a 65 year old female presenting with a history of pain redness and watering for two weeks duration and defective vision for two weeks so this is the clinical picture of the patient so what is the most probable diagnosis as you all know this is very simple okay so this is a case of hyperpion corneal ulcer so when you get a case like this how will you start so we start with the history these are the different symptoms of the patient so pain redness photophobia decreased vision and discharge so if patients uh, comes with a history of discharge you may ask like whether it is watery mucopurulent or if the color has got a greenish tinge so you may ask the history of trauma any contact lens wear any drug history exposure to contaminated water or any previous ocular surgeries so the, what are the signs you look so first we start with the facial symmetry and look for the proptosis or if there is any lag of thalmosis look for any scars of the lid also examine the lid which is very important look for trichiasis entropion or ectropion so if there is any history of chronic dacrocystitis or any scar in the lacrimal sac area you have to think of pneumococcus and if there is any features of canaliculitis think of actinomycetes okay so if the pain it is more than the symptoms you may think of acanthamoeba of the symptoms less the signs are more you may think of fungal corneal ulcer so if any history of sudden relief of pain just think of perforation okay so we are going to the proper examination of the corneal ulcer so what all things you have to look so you have to look the location size shape margins base depth the surrounding area if there is any pigmentation it is very important to mention that and vascularization so vascularization you have to mention the quadrants how many quadrants are involved whether it is superficial or deep and look for any dm folds endothelial plaques and keratic precipitates look for the ac reaction and if hyperpion mention that also so the location it will give a clue if the location is in the superior part most probably it will be a shield ulcer and inferior part we have exposure keratitis so mention the location whether it is central paracentral or peripheral the shape of the ulcer is also very important you will be seeing a dendritic ulcer in viral etiology ring ulcer can be in acanthamoeba so the margins of the ulcer examine very well because it is very important you may get a well defined margin in a healing or a heal ulcer ill defined in where there is active infection or infiltration so feathery margin will give a clue to the fungal etiology punched out margin neurotropic and overhanging margins in murens also so the surrounding area that is also very important look for any satellite lesion scars or edema so hyperpion you have to mention the surface the color of and the height and the mobility of the hyperpion so don't forget to examine the sclera also which is very very important so this is some of the clue which 
help you for a diagnosis. Like any slowly progressing localized inflammation, you may think of streptococcus epidermis, hemolytic streptococcus actinomyces, like rapidly progressing, and you may think of staph aureus, pseudomonas neisseriae, etc. So gram-positive coca, okay, usually they will have a separate infiltrate with distinct margin and minimum surrounding corneal edema. So gram-negative bacilli that will have a high tissue destruction, the borders are usually ill-defined and severe surrounding reaction. So some of the organism which has got a specific pattern like nocardia which has got a reed pattern and acnomysex which has also got a cracked windshield appearance. So this is also... All, thing, all these things will a clue to the diagnosis. Okay, so how will you write a professional diagnosis? You have to mention the eye, like cornea ulcer, right eye or left eye, and mention the location and the grade and the, whether it is complicated or uncomplicated, and also mention the stage and the possible etiology. So this is the just a clue and tips to how will you evaluate a corneal ulcer case. So next. A few points, how will you differentiate infective and sterile infiltrate? This is also very important. Sometimes you get infiltrate which is sterile, okay. So that is usually in peripheral ulcerative keratitis. So you, you should also differentiate these features. And you may also get a question like how will you differentiate this conjunctival and circumcorneal congestion also, okay. So never forget to check the corneal section, which is very, very important. So next we'll see next case. So this is a case, usually we get a history like 18-year-old boy, defective vision, which is very progressive and painless. You may get a history like frequent change of glasses and symptoms of allergy. So what is the most probable diagnosis? Yes, definitely. So these are the usual signs of the patient and you have to specifically look for these signs. So this is a usual clinical presentation. So patient usually present with blurring of vision, monocular diplopia, glare, halos, and you may specifically ask for any contact lens where family history of ectopy and past history of any surgeries or previous scans, okay. So these are the usual signs. So you are, don't forget to look these signs, like steepening of the cornea, any thinning, scarring, and other particular signs which is very specific, as you know, fleecher ring, vox triae, increased visibility of corneal rings, any ruptures in the desmets membrane, all these signs, and you may get uh, other features like some other disorders like corneal disorders and non-corneal disorder which are all associated with keratoconus. So you may also look for these signs also, okay. So you may get some systemic associations also. So you may ask the question or you may get any systemic signs of these syndromes also. So don't forget to look these. So another case, this is a 60-year-old patient present with a history of pain, redness, watering and defective vision and history of cataract surgery in the past. So what is the most probable diagnosis? PBK or pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. So these are the different causes of corneal edema and what all things you will like when you get a case of corneal edema. So particularly in a case of PBK, you have to look for these signs. So edema, you have to mention the location, the extent, the degree of edema, and look for the other signs, particularly the epithelial defect, microsis, bullae, stromal haze, endothelial folds, vascularization, and whether there's an increased corneal thickness. So localized edema, what are the most common causes? You may get in dismissed membrane detachment, instrument, touch, vitreous weak or herpetic keratitis. So any limbus to limbus edema, always think of TAS or toxic anterior segment syndrome. So other, uh, apart from cornea, what are the other signs you have to look? So you have to look for the shape of the cornea, any peaking, so look for the presence of the vitreous. Pupil may get dilated due to any previous iris damage. So patchy iris atrophy, always think of segmental iris atrophy, always think of a viral etiology. So anterior chamber reaction, you have to mention, and specifically you have to look for these, any vitreous strands in the AC, any retained lens matter, keratic precipitates, IOL, and in the IOL, you have to see whether any malposition of the IOL, any deposits in the IOL, and also don't forget to check the intraocular pressure, okay. So you may get a question on vascularization. So it is very important, you have to differentiate the superficial and deep vascularization. So you may get questions on dystrophy and degeneration, how to differentiate these. Uh, so 65 year old, this is another case, defective vision and history of cornea transplant surgery. 
So what is the most probable diagnosis? Failure. Yeah. So graph rejection or failure. So you, may, you have to differentiate between rejection and failure. I will be dealing that. Just a single slide. So what are the common symptoms? You may get pain, redness, photophobia, and vision. So when you get a case of graph rejection, what all signs you have to check? So it is very important to check the, uh, the circumcorneal congestion. Sometimes you get uh, congestion without any other corneal or any other signs. So you have to look for any raised epithelial line, that is the epithelial rejection line, corneal haze, stromal infiltrate. If there is any character precipitates, look for the number, location, identify the old, whether it is new. Look for AC reaction and cododose line, which is very important, that is the endothelial rejection line. So don't forget to look the graft hose junction. So you have to mention the suture, whether it is interrupted or continuous. Mention any loose suture, protruding nodes, any infiltrate, vascularization, and look for the quadrants. So how will you differentiate a sterile and infectious infiltrate? This is also very important. So primary and graft rejection. I'm not going to the details. So this is the last case. Uh, so this is case of anterior uveitis. So how will you appraise? Usually patient present with pain and photophobia, redness and blurring vision. So usually acute onset, you'll go to a diagnosis of acute anterior uveitis. So sometimes symptoms may not be present. Patient present with a blurred vision, usually chronic. And pain, photophobia, blurring of vision with a period of inactivity of more than three months of medication, you'll get a chronic recurrent anterior uveitis. So ocular history, very, very important. Mention all these features. So systemic history, which is very, very important in uveitis, joint pain, fever, cough, weight loss, oral genital urinary ulcers, skin lesions, drug intake, all these history is very, very important. Systemic evaluation. So examination is also very, very important. Lid and adnexa. I have to mention all these conjunctiva, cornea. So cornea, I'm already told, but specifically you have to see the size, the morphology and the distribution of keratic precipitates. Like fugues, you will get uh, entirely distributed all of the endothelium, stellate KPs, herpetic disease, so keratic precipitates. So please see whether it is old or new, whether it is granulomatous or non-granulomatous. I need a chamber, you have to mention the AC reaction, also look for other signs like hypopion, hyphema, iris, broad base, persistent, Posterior sinicae, always think of tuberculosis, 10 shape anterior sinicae, ocular sarcoid. So nodules, as you all know, look for these signs. So iris atrophy, any transillumination defects in the iris. Lens, look for the cataract, inflammatory membrane, or any pigments of the anterior lens capsule. And gonioscopy, which is also very, very important. So hyperpion, whether it is mobile, usually we think of Bechet, immobile, which is HLA associated. So these are all you know, I think, the features of granulomatous and non-granulomatous. So investigations, recurrent, severe, all these cases, you have to investigate a patient. So how, provisional diagnosis is very important. You have to mention the diagnosis, laterality, chronicity, significant associated features. Mention the differential diagnosis, investigations, and treatment. So any case, don't forget to draw the diagram, corneal diagram, which is very, very important. So these are the color code which is used for the corneal diagram. Okay, so any anterior segment case, you may get a question on slit lamp. So please study this also. So I wish all the best for, and next we have a discussion on glaucoma. I invite Dr. Sandhya. Good morning all. We'll uh, deal uh, with how to present a case of glaucoma. We'll uh, first go to the history. As you all know, primary open angle glaucoma is always asymptomatic and primary narrow angle glaucoma can have history of subacute attacks which you should ask in the history which may have subtle uh, pain and colored halos most probably during the evening time. <coughs> And then secondary glaucoma, especially if it is unilateral, if the glaucoma is unilateral, you have to ask for a history of trauma, steroid use or uveitis. Now, on examination, 
uh, I think you can see the difference that is here you can see in the uh, this side you can see deepening of the upper sulcus so what is this this is basically prostaglandin associated periorbitopathy syndrome and these are the features of this so always you have to look for these features then you have to look for some port wine stain or something over the face the most common condition is Sturge Weber syndrome and these are other um, syndromes where you can get uh, port wine stain and glaucoma then nevus of water is another important condition where you get this mel I mean, uh, melanosis over one side of the face and these are associated with increased risk of uveal melanoma and glaucoma on anterior segment you will have to look for this conjunctival hyperemia which can occur as a part of chronic drug use and also dilated episcleral vessels which can be seen in elevated episcleral venous pressure these are the causes of elevated episcleral venous pressure and then uh, you have to look for drug induced conjunctival and corneal changes out of them the most important ones are reticular epithelial corneal edema caused by rho kinase inhibitors then recurrent herpes simplex keratitis which is caused by PGA analogs and also conjunctival hyperomia which is more with PGA analogs alpha agonists and also rho kinase inhibitors so this is an example of corneal edema that is reticular epithelial corneal edema caused by rho kinase inhibitors and it is more with netarsudil now in anterior segment, what is this? This is correctopia and also polychoria. What is the differential diagnosis? You can have IC syndrome if it is unilateral. And if it is bilateral, you have to think of accent field regret normally. In IC syndrome, especially essential iris atrophy, you also have peripheral anterior synecae in gonioscopy. And in accent field regret, you have prominent Schwalbe's line, which is called as embryotoxon, posterior embryotoxon, and also prominent iris process in gonioscopy. Then the second component of uh, this uh, ICE syndrome is Chandler syndrome which can cause predominant corneal edema and important differential diagnosis is Fuchs endothelial dystrophy and also posterior polymorphous corneal dystrophy. So both this Chandler syndrome and posterior polymorphous dystrophy can cause glaucoma. How to differentiate? The Desmet's membrane will be normal in Chandler syndrome whereas it will be affected in PPCT. Then again in Fuchs there won't be any associated glaucoma. Another third component of this ICA syndrome is Cogan Rees anomaly. This is Cogan Rees anomaly where you can get multiple iris pigmented nodules and important differential diagnosis is iris melanoma. Then you have to look for pupillary, the pupillary rough. So you look for any loss of pupillary rough which may occur as part of aging but it is an early feature of pseudo exfoliative glaucoma. Then also you have to look for neovascularization of iris. Then what is this here you can see pseudo exfoliation over the pupillary border along with that you get pseudo exfoliated membrane over the anterior lens capsule associated with that you have peripupillary iris atrophy and in gonioscopy you get sampulacy line and patchy pigmentation of trabecular meshwork then again you can get Krugen, uh, Krukenberg spindle along with that you have concave virus configuration that is usually seen in pigment dispersion glaucoma and uh, along with that you can get Shee's line or Zentmeyer's line and the uh, atrophy, iris atrophy is different, it is mid peripheral iris atrophy and you can get homogeneous pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork whereas it is coarse and patchy in pseudo exfoliation. Then you also have to look for iris changes like iris atrophy and iris whirling, it is seen in post congestive glaucoma, iris whirling. Then you also have to look for the lens where you can get subluxation, dislocation, total cataract, all these can cause secondary glaucomas and even you can get if it is pseudophakia, vitreous blocking the pupillary area, that also you have to look for. Anterior chamber assessment, you know, all uh, this is done by, first method is Van Herrick's grading and this is the classical Van Herrick's grading, you all know that. And uh, what are the other features? So you always have to do gonioscopy in all cases of glaucoma. And in gonioscopy, you can see that the first one is the open angle. You can see the all four structures, that is the root of the iris, uh, scleral spur, uh, trabecular meshwork and Schwalbe's line. This is a closed angle. Always look for scler um, corneal wedge. Why it is important? Because sometimes you may, you may get pigmentation over the Schwalbe's line, you, which you may mistake for trabecular meshwork. So always you have to look for this corneal wedge, because this corneal wedge that meets at the Schwalbe's line. Now this is, this is angle recession glaucoma and the other one is Sorry, this is uh, blood in Schlem's canal and this is neovascularization of the angle. 
and the, uh, you should know how to differentiate between normal iris process and also peripheral anterior synecae. Irises process are usually fine processes whereas peripheral anterior synecae are broad and they extend to the scleral spur, the iris process but this PAS can extend beyond the scleral spur and they do not, iris processes do not obscure the angle structures whereas PAS do obscure. Then now you can see this is angle recession especially if the glaucoma is unilateral always think of a secondary cause. This is silicon oil blocking the angle chamber. Now always while drawing you have to write the structure, posterior most structure which is seen and always you try to uh, put an arrow and write the structure which is seen after manipulative gonioscopy or indentation gonioscopy. That is the best method rather than writing grades as grade 3 or 4 or 2 or like that. Now optic disc evaluation is a very important one. You have to actually quantify the optic disc measurement which you can easily do in a slit lamp examination. You reduce the size of the beam both vertical and horizontal and you can see a marking over the slit lamp and you have to multiply by a multiplication factor according to the type of lens you use. Then one important factor while evaluating disc is the disc size. Always you have to think of the disc size because in these two pictures you may think that the cup disc ratio is more in this but actually the disc size is also more. So always think of the disc size before commenting the cup disc ratio. And these again you have this is a small disc, this is again a small disc but this is a large disc. This is DDLS score, hope you all may be aware of that because the problem is in DDLS you are measuring the rim width whereas in cup disc ratio you are only measuring the cup disc value alone. So always you have to think, uh, you should know what is this DDLS scoring. Now we will see some features of the optic disc. Here you can see the cup disc ratio is around 0.7. Here there is inferior thinning of the neuroretinal rim. So always you have to think of ISNT rule, inferior rim is usually thicker than uh, the other rim. So again here it is almost same, inferior is not thick. So it is again uh, pathological. Here it looks normal. Here you can see both the superior, superior rim is more thinner than the inferior. It is almost, this picture almost it is glaucomatous optic atrophy. Now you have to look for peripapillary areas. You have beta zone which is closer to disc and alpha zone is which is outside. Beta zone is significant of glaucoma and it usually corresponds to the area of nerve fiber layer atrophy. And always you have to look for the nerve fiber layer defects. You can see it is better appreciated in red free. Here you can see a superior. Here you can see both superior and inferior. And you have to always see the HFA findings also. Some clinical scenarios. Here is a 56 year old female with normal intraocular pressure in right eye and slightly high intraocular pressure in left eye. Angles are open. Right eye the cup disc ratio almost looks normal. Here you can see the HFA also looks normal. So it is almost normal in right eye. In left eye you can see there is a, a superior thinning. So you expect a field defect in the inferior part. So there is an inferior arcuate scotoma. So always correlate. Here also you can see a scotoma in the infronasal part. So where do you expect the change in the disc? Suprotemporal. Yes. So you have to look for the change suprotemporally. Then again you can see the inferior neuroretinal rim is thin here and you get a corresponding superior arcuate scotoma. And uh, here you can see the uh, disc looks almost normal but here you can see the inferior neuroretinal rim is slightly thinner and you can see the corresponding field effect in the superior part. Here again superior both superior and inferior rim is thin so you get bilateral or uh, double arcuate scotomas. So again this is another patient with occasional blur, complaints of occasional blurring of vision and slight pain in right eye. Van is grade 1, AT is almost normal so you can see the angle. This is occludable angles. Do we need to do laser PI? Yes. Why? Because you are seeing peripheral anterior synecae and also in patients which uh, who need uh, frequent dilatations, you, if you get occludable angles, definitely you have to do laser PI. And this is another patient again closed angles post PI. You can see there is slight inferior neuroretinal rim thinning here. Here both superior and inferior rim is thin. So what is the diagnosis? Primary narrow angle glaucoma. Why? Because there is optic nerve damage in this. Thank you. Now we would like to invite Dr. Uh, Babita for a discussion on orbit cases. Good morning. These are the common cases kept for examination orbit and neuroophthalmology. They include bilateral axial proptosis due to thyroid ophthalmopathy. 
then you eccentric proptosis due to orbital mass lesions uh, proptosis due to orbital inflammatory diseases proptosis with multiple cranial nerve palsy including either superior orbital fissure syndrome or orbital apex syndrome uh, blood fractures oculomotor nerve palsy abducens nerve palsy multiple cranial nerve palsy ocular myasthenia and chronic progressive external ophthalmopathy for all cases this is the approach to get a clinical diagnosis then first we have to take a good history about the presenting complaint uh, first i ask about the onset duration progression aggravating or relieving factors or whether it is constant or intermittent other symptoms in orbital cases are visual symptoms like defective vision field defects or diplopia and other symptoms include redness and edema pain and discomfort other ent symptoms and sy 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 symptoms of systemic diseases Uh, symptoms pertaining to neurological cases include ptosis diplopia limited ocular motility other neurological symptoms headache and nausea and history of hypertension diabetes and hyperlipidemia are important in neurological cases then take a good past history then negative history also very important in orbital and neuroophthalmology cases then inspect the head posture you get the abnormal head postures in you am restriction with diplopia and blood fractures then assess the ocular posture by hirschberg test and cover test then assess facial symmetry then examine the extraocular movement both uniocularly and binocularly binocularly and note the movement either this way or this way then examine the lid and periocular area for edema erythema ecchymosis bell's phenomenon lid closure and lid signs of thyroiditis and uh, examine conjunctiva for congestion chemosis uh, dilated episcleral vessels or salmon patch as in lymphoma orbital lymphoma examine cornea for dry spots any evidence of exposure keratitis or superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis or conjunctivitis then pupillary examination is very important in both neuro neurological cases and also orbital cases uh, examine for anisocoria afferent defect and different defect then visual acuity uh, reduced visual acuity usually seen in compressive optic neuropathy ischemic optic neuropathy and exposure keratitis if there is any compression sometimes we get refractive errors also then assess color vision contrast sensitivity and field assessment then palpate the globe for tenderness temperature and assess the sensation over the eyeball periorbital area and corneal sens sensation is also very important then palpate for any masses palpate the orbital rim and palpate whether the proptosis is reducible or compressible is there any resistance to retropulsion present or not then assess finger insinuation whether it is possible or not finger insinuation has to be tested in primary position with little finger then palpate for any pulsations this is a four stage index here four stage index is positive for elevation and this negative for depression this is four section test then here the primary um, anterior view there is no much proptosis in this patient but by nafsiger sign you can get the minimal proptosis in the left side this is bird's eye view then you can assess the proptosis from lower part that is uh, worms view also helps to diagnose minimal proptosis this is custom bombs rule test when we keep a rule in contact with the superior and the orbital superior inferior orbital margins usually there is a space between the eyeball and the orbit or there is a symmetry between both eyes if there is a symmetry or this space is obliterated that means there is proptosis the next is proptometry proptometry can be done with plastic ruler or other sophisticated instruments the andro anteroposterior reading more than 21 mm or difference between two eyes more than 2 mm is diagnostic of proptosis you can uh, plastic rule ruler we can measure the anterior and posterior distance from the lateral orbital margin to the corneal apex horizontal from the root of the nose to corneal apex and vertical from the center of superior orbital margin to the corneal apex this is lewd's x of thermometer this is hertel's x of thermometer and nagel's x of thermometer you can measure proptosis using any of this instrument then ptosis measurement ptosis has to be measured by vertical fissure height uh, margin reflex distance and levator function test 
then do a tonometry and differential tonometry. Differential tonometry can be done with either Shear's tonometer or using a planation tonometer, planation tonometer with flexible chin rest. Uh, in differential tonometry, the reading between primary position and the restricted position more than 6 mm of mercury is positive. Then never forget to do a gonioscopy. In the in gonioscopy, you can diagnose blood presence of blood in the Schlem's canal as in this case. This is a karyotico cavernous fistula. Then do a Schirmer test to diagnose dry eye, presence of dry eye. By all these tests, you can differentiate the proptosis from uh, dystopia and proptosis from a pseudoproptosis. Then auscultate the um, eyeball. The ex both the examiner and patient should be in a comfortable position in a quiet room and keep the bell of the stethoscope firmly over a closed eyeball. And ask the patient to fix the fix with the other eye. Then all, ask the patient to hold his breath and you get a high-pitched brew in the systolic phase, usually seen in vascular lesions causing proptosis. Then ophthalmoscopic examination is very important for optic disc changes, vascular changes, macular edema and choroidal folds. Then system examination is very important in case of proptosis, including examination of regional lymph nodes, thyroid gland, nose and paranasal sinuses. If we are suspecting orbital metastasis, examine for evidence of primary malignancies. Then in case of neuro-ophthalmological case, central nervous system examination and other cranial nerve assessment is also very important. Then all relevant investigation has to be done. Then there are various imaging modalities are available. This include both non-invasive and invasive imaging. X-ray is very important in diagnosis of bony pathology, benign lesions, calcification and hyperostosis. Then various X-ray projections are available to study various walls of the orbit. Then ultrasonography helps us to uh, diagnose cystic lesions, vascular lesions and any soft tissue swellings in the orbit. Then uh, CT scan is very important in case of bony lesions. High resolution CT uh, coronal sections of 1 millimeter cut is very important to study optic nerve and optic canal. So hilal and trochal criteria, then for this we have to draw a straight line, interzygomatic straight line, then measure from this line to the coronal apex if it is more than 21 millimeters or difference between two eyes more than 2 millimeters diagnostic of proptosis. And then various uh, CT sections are uh, has to be done to uh, read, study all orbital walls. Then MRI is useful in soft tissue swelling, optic nerve lesions, orbital metastasis, pseudo tumors, and tumors with the intracranial extension. Then orbital arteriography helps us to diagnose carotid cavernous fistula and ophthalmic artery aneurysms. Digital subtraction angiography is the investigation of choice for keratico cavernous fistula. Then histopathological examination is important. Uh, we can do either fine needle aspiration biopsy. If the lesion is not palpable or not visible, it has to be done under UST or CT guided. Or if it is visible and palpable, can you do either incisional biopsy or excisional biopsy. Then summary and diagnosis, how we summarize? We have to give a very good summary, including negative, relevant negative history. Then in orbital cases, you include anatomical diagnosis, etiological diagnosis, and pathological diagnosis. So for this case, what is the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis in this case? This is a bilateral axial proptosis, probable etiology is thyroiditis in active stage. This is bilateral axial proptosis, probable di diagnosis, probable etiology thyroiditis with the active stage. Then for neuroophthalmological cases, anatomical diagnosis and then you have to localize the lesions, then etiological diagnosis. For this case, it is a, it's a left ocular motor nerve palsy, pupil sparing, site of lesions, basilar part and etiology is ischemic mononeuropathy. This is, this is for the localization of neurological cases. So, you have to do an uh, objective and structured clinical examination to get a good diagnosis in orbit and neuroophthalmological cases. This uh, QR code is access to this particular presentation. If you need other presentations, if you can message me, I shall send it. Or my JRs uh, at Government Medical College. If you can contact them, I'll send it to you. No worries. You just listen to the presentation, focus on the understanding of the topic. Uh, I think uh, next we have. Uh, Sharmin, Madam will be dealing with posterior segment uh, che examination.
so we'll be dealing with the uh, fundus cases next this comes under your short case category and uh, in this you know you don't get a history you only get to see the fundus and uh, fundus drawing is of most important so before we go to the fundus what do you need to look at you need to look at the media clarity so use your slit lamp and use your indirect ophthalmoscope the media clarity uh, if there is any haze localize where it is at the cornea at the lens at the anterior chamber or the vitreous so if it is in the vitreous you can grade it with your indirect ophthalmoscope according to 0 to 4 plus then after that we come to the disc in the disc madam has already described you need to uh, mention the size the shape the cup size the nrr the color and the uh, is in rule if it is violated or not then the vessels on the disc and exudates and vessels in the peripapillary area so this is the first case can you tell me what this is you can see there is only a pallor involving the temporal aspect of the disc so this is a case of temporal pallor so that would be partial optic atrophy and this is a totally white disc pale disc the margins are well defined the vessels look normal so this would be a case of primary optic atrophy then we have the margins are blurred you can see there is a resolving edema there so this would be secondary optic atrophy then we have the classic consecutive optic atrophy so in optic atrophy cases you need to know the causes how to differentiate between each of them and the field effects that can be associated so in these cases most often we do not uh, the treatment aspects the newer aspects you have to read up and in temporal uh, pallor that is most important because you must not mi uh, miss that then coming to disc edema here you have a case of unilateral disc edema in the left eye it is very slight but you can see there's a slight blurring of the margins and in any case of disc edema think of your 10 signs which have been described for papal edema you have the mechanical and the vascular factors and each of these has to mention has to be mentioned in all cases of disc edema and you will be asked about the foster kennedy syndrome the pseudo foster kennedy syndrome the measurement and grading of RAPD, the field defects involved, and FFA and OCT findings relevant to each of the causes of disc edema, be it unilateral or bilateral. And also, what are the causes of pseudopapal edema and how you will rule, out, rule them out. So, this is a case of bilateral disc edema, the classic. What is this? What do we have here? Bilateral disc edema? Yes, papal edema. So, uh, can anyone tell me what the big blind spot syndrome is? Okay, so that is not related to disc edema, it is actually mutes. Okay, anyway, then, come, then we, come, we finish with the disc and come on to the vasculature. Look at the branching pattern, is, if it is dichotomous or not. Look at the caliber, you mention it as the AV ratio. And if there is any uh, celioretinal arteries present, you need to mention that separately. Look at the neovascularization, if it is present anywhere on the disc. And also differentiate it from collaterals on the disc. So this is a 60 year old gentleman who has hypertension and dyslipidemia for 5 years and he comes with a sudden loss of vision for 5 days. So the diagnosis is very apparent, I'm sure all of you know that. The more important thing is the fundus drawing. So you have to know, uh, I thank my JRs for these uh, fundus drawings, they've done a beautiful job. So get your color codes right and you, can, you may also get uh, vasca, branch vein occlusions or an old occlusion also as your fundus case. So look for macular edema in the acute uh, situation and if it's a chronic or an old, case, uh, old occlusion, look for NVE, NVD or any presence of epiretinal membranes and vitreous hemorrhage if it is present. Then in the other eye, do not forget the other eye in cases of occlusion, you have to look for hypertensive and diabetic retinopathy and also glaucoma because glaucoma is a risk factor for vascular occlusions. Then you have the systemic diseases. These are questions that may come to you, not that you are going to ask these to the patient. So look, uh, ask about the, you'll be asked about duration, control, medication, how it affects the vascular occlusion. And if it's a young patient, what all lab investigations you need to do to rule out hypercoagulatory disorders. Treatment options like PRP, anti-VEGF, all these you please read up. Then the 100 day glaucoma and the relevant trials. Then we, the next case is a 72 year old gentleman with diabetes, hypertension and CAD. He has sudden profound loss of vision since the morning. There is a grade 1 RIPD and best corrected visual equity is PL+. Plus. Any, any clues to any thoughts on your diagnosis? Very good. So this is CRAO here and we have the classic triad of 
palette disc edi paler and uh, cherry red spot with cattle trucking so in CRAO, you need to know about the causes of cherry red spot and bilateral cherry red spot, especially in the pediatric age group, systemic and ocular risk factors, investigations and treatment options. So this is the fundus drawing uh, of the case on, on the right side, you have moderate NPDR. You have dot and blot hemorrhages and macular edema there. And on the left side, you have the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So... Uh, the color coding is important here. And in this, again, you, you may be asked about how the duration, the medication's control of diabetes helps, your, uh, helps or worsens the disease. The treatment, if the patient has had any systemic treatment or uh, any other ocular treatment like lasers, anti-VEGF, intravitreal steroids, and other comorbidities which can worsen the diabetic retinopathy. And if the pupil is mid-dilated, as some uh, diabetic patients have pupillopathy, you may be able to make out an NVI. So be sure to look at the slit lamp also. And intraocular pressure is important because the patient may have coexistent glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma, or a neovascular component. Then uh, you may be asked about the ETDRS. You will be asked about the ETDRS and the International Clinical Disease Severity Scale. In the uh, DME, you have to grade it according to FFA, according to OCT, and landmark studies, the UK PDS, all that, please read up. So differentials in case of a diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is almost a sure case. All of you will have one fundus case as diabetic retinopathy. You can have a hypertensive retinopathy, a vascular occlusion, ocular ischemic syndrome, radiation retinopathy, vasculitis, or hematological disorders. All these can come in the differentials for a diabetic retinopathy. So this is a 68-year-old lady, uh, difficulty in reading newspapers and distortion in shape of objects since two weeks. So she has diabetes and hypertension and cataract surgery has been done. So her best corrected is 4 by 60 and 6 by 18. I heard the diagnosis, you are correct. This is a uh, wet AMD in the right eye and you can see the features of dry AMD in the left eye. So uh, when you are dealing with the case of CNVM, look at the extent, the intraretinal and subretinal heme that is present, document that. If there is any exudates, subretinal fluid, polyps, drusen, uh, anything that is seen, signs of previous inflammation because you may be dealing with a secondary CNVM. And in the other eye, again, if there is AMD, the type of drusen, if there is any geographic atrophy or scarring present, and treatment options, the newer anti-VEGF agents, low vision aids, and uh, also the findings that you get on FFA, ICG, OCT, and OCT angio. So this is a, another 65-year-old lady, loss of vision of two months duration, cataract surgery five years ago. So one has CFCF and the other is 69. So what is this? Yeah, so this is the regmatogenous retinal detachment. You need to tell about the type, the extent, location of the tear and uh, hole, any degenerations, any other degenerations present. If the macula is on or off, if there is a uh, PVR present, the grade of the PVR, and PVD, if it is present or absent. On the slit lamp, look at the IUL status, which may indicate a turbulent cataract surgery, any YAG capsulotomy that has been done, and other eye, look for peripheral degenerations, hole, tear, or PVD. So in RD, you need to uh, ask in the history the vision after cataract surgery, if it was good, recurrent redness pain, which may indicate a uveitis, YAG procedure, trauma, and flashes. Then the other thing is types of RD, the risk factors, ocular and systemic, link of rule, definitely, and treatment options. So this, uh, we'll just go straight to the uh, picture. You can see this is a classic case of retinitis pigmentosa. So you ask for difficulty in night vision, hearing loss, that is you are dealing with a syndromic RP, look at that, family history, and if you can do a pedigree charting, it will get you extra marks. Look for cataract, any myopic refraction, keratoconus, intraocular pressure variations, again glaucoma there, the RP triad, and in the macula, look for edema, atrophy, or a epiretinal membrane. So this, what is this? What are so you may have floaters, you may have an, uh, vitreous cells close to the retinitis lesion. So th this you may pick up on uh, slit lamp, then or the indirect. So look for uh, differences between retinitis and choroiditis, satellite lesions if it presents, any chiralis, uh, any arteritis that is present, and the DD would include post fever retinitis, TB co chorioretinitis, viral retinitis, and non-infective retinitis as in bear shape. You have to learn about the congenital toxo features and macular scar. Why the macula is involved in? Talk so. so next I invite Dr. Prasanna to for her talk.
good morning all uh, i am going to rush through a series of small topics so your instrument section even though this is uh, a, uh, last part of your exam still it is important you have to identify the common uh, surgical instruments its uh, use in, in indications of surgery how how will you do a pre operative evaluation then steps of surgery complications and special situations like in cataract phaconit or uh, flax etc then so, so common surgery like cataract surgery uh, trabeculectomy dcr dct surgery etc so you have to identify all these instruments so special surgeries like cataplasty you have to know about the uh, these all these instruments and its uh, indications uh, surgical uh, indications of the surgery complications etc etc then next is specimen which can be a gross pathological uh, specimen which can be a full eyeball or a cross section of uh, eyeball uh, which you have to tell about or uh, the uh, section that is an enucleated or a cross section of eyeball showing a second picture showing a intraocular tumor second and third picture showing an intraocular tumor probable diagnosis and how will you treat you have to know all this then about the histopathology same histopathology can be uh, um, this uh, retinoblastoma malignant melanoma rarely rhinospordia so you know the rosette florets etc then microbiology i'm not going in deep into that anyway afb you have to know uh, uh, leprosy as well as uh, tuberculosis then histopath um, next is hfa where you have to see the uh, print out whether it is a full field 30-2 24-2 or 10-2 uh, then uh, look for the uh, patient data whether it, uh, reliability criteria is fulfilling Uh, what is the field defect whether it is a glaucomatic field defect as in this you can see an arcuate field defect or this is also an another arcuate field defect or it is a neurological field defect uh, respecting vertigo meridian so homonymous hemianopia retrochiasmal lesion uh, lesion of the visual pathway so retrochiasmal lesion can cause as i said um Mm, homonymous hemianopia so here you can see a tumor in the occipital uh, area so the so here you can see a scan picture you don't know which is that so you have to tell at the end which picture is that so section uh, the scanning can be either a corona scan axial scan or a sagittal scan axial scan divides the body into upper part and lower part upper and lower half um the coronal will be passing uh, through uh, the um, so that it is dividing the body into anterior and posterior sagittal into midline left and right so the first picture shows you can see you can see this picture this is a coronal axial scan this is a sagittal scan and this is last one is a corona scan so how will you differentiate between ct and uh, mri ct has low resolution compared to mri so bony anatomy is more marked in uh, ct compared to mri and uh, structures structure details will not be that uh, defined uh, in ct as mri so bony density is maximum density of bone is um, seen there as uh, the uh, maximum uh, so mri is you can see the greater details t2 t1 weighted and t2 weighted uh, mri are there you can remember t2 by uh, t2 especially uh, strong uh, water is uh, uh, you can see water as strong as white signal so both has two t2 as well as water is two o has two so uh, see mri showing Uh, water content in the csf that is white as t2 weighted t1 is csf will be black in color so this picture is first picture uh, both are first two pictures are ct and the last two pictures are mri and this is t2 weighted you can see the vitreous is seeing white in this 
So here you can see this is a CT picture showing uh, intraocular foreign body. So how will you uh, say in your exam? So your axial CT scan showing uh, orb, uh, brain and orbit with name and age of the patient with a high ISO, hypo or hyperdense lesion in the uh, eye or in the orbit, whatever, wherever it is. So here it is in the eye, close to the lens. So it is an intraocular foreign body. Here you can see another uh, mass lesion, which is isodense with your uh, muscle or brain. Here another, you can see, what is this? Can you describe this? Ah, differential diagnosis? Okay, thyroid. Here also this is the corona section showing enlarged extraocular muscles. So this is also uh, thyroid. This picture you can see pituitary gland. This is an MRI picture which uh, T1 or T2 weighted. Here you can see the CSF. Black. Black. White. Okay. <laughs> okay. So can you see a tumor here? This is pituitary tumor pressing the chiasma. Okay. Here you can see this is CT showing a bone fracture impinging optic nerve. Here, calcification. This is proptosis with intraocular mass with calcification. DD? Retinoblastoma. DD? <laughs> Retinoblastoma. Okay. Here, already so one CT. Thyroid. Thyroid. So, this is. CT versus MRI of intraocular tumors, th retinoblastoma. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So uh, that was uh, it was a challenge for us to bring an overview uh, to cover the whole topic in less than 50 minutes. How was the session? Was it useful? Uh, would you like to have a PG exam oriented co crash course at our medical college? Fine, we'll uh, take this forwards and let you know by next year. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.